Hi, I'm Jim Fellman. I'm in private practice with the law firm of Kynes, Markman and Fellman in Tampa, Florida. And I'm Cynthia Orr, and I'm in private practice in San Antonio, Texas with Goldstein, Goldstein and Hilly. And we're the chairs of the criminal justice section. And this year we have an exciting array of activities and projects and committees that we encourage you all to follow and be involved in. I think there's a widespread recognition that we have too many people in jail in this country for too long. And that's a recognition that has uh, become apparent to many, including the President and the Attorney General. Earlier this year, the Deputy Attorney General announced an initiative whereby the President intends to grant clemency to shorten the sentences of some prisoners under very specific criteria. And the Deputy Attorney General has called upon the private bar to assist in identifying worthy candidates for clemency. It is a massive undertaking, and the Clemency Project 2014 is an effort to respond to that call. So Clemency Project 2014 is an informal coalition of five organizations, the Federal Defenders, the American Civil Liberties Union, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, Families Against Mandatory Minimums, and the Criminal Justice Section of the American Bar Association. Our goal is to recruit and train attorneys who are willing to work on a pro bono basis to screen potential applicants for clemency to see whether they meet the criteria as announced by the Deputy Attorney General. And then for those who do meet the criteria to assist in the drafting and preparation and submission of petitions for clemency for those individuals. The best way that you can help with Clemency Project 2014 is by volunteering for the project. You don't have to be an expert in criminal law. We have training available at on-demand webinars. It's about five hours of training materials. And then we have resource counsel who would be standing by to assist in answering any questions that you might have. If you are willing to volunteer for the project, you can do so by visiting our website at www.clemencyproject2014.org. So most people believe that discovery in criminal cases is similar to discovery in civil cases, that we have interrogatories and depositions and information about the case before the case begins. But in most jurisdictions, including in federal courts, discovery is very limited just to what your client possesses or what your client's statement was. And, uh, it, it's just so limited that often this results in surprise at trial. And the biggest problem is that oftentimes favorable evidence, that is evidence that's favorable to the person accused, is not disclosed at all or too late to use in a case. Recognizing this problem in a number of famous cases uh, that resulted ultimately in uh, exoneration of individuals uh, the ABA has discussed these problems. We've debated having resolutions that could come to the council to change these matters, and we decided no. Instead, a very sweeping uh, reevaluation of criminal discovery was important. So we formed a task force uh, in one of our most important institutions, that is the Criminal Justice Standards Group, uh, to reexamine what should criminal discovery be. The criminal justice standards are the most vaunted work of any criminal justice organization. They're cited by the U.S. Supreme Court in opinion after opinion to set the standard by which we evaluate lawyers' work, that is, prosecutors and defense lawyers. With regard to the discovery standards, the last time that they were revised were in 1994 and then adopted it as ABA policy in the House of Delegates in 1996. And so we've, as we often do, uh, formed a task force. These are members from prosecution, federal and state, from the defense. We have professors, academics, and judges, uh, and liaisons from many of the major groups and stakeholders in the criminal justice process. They work to revise the standards, and then we have a rigorous evaluation process. Ultimately, they're presented to council, uh, read twice and approved, and then go up to the House of Delegates and the American Bar Association for approval 
to become ABA policy and of course typically become law across the nation. The sentences for federal offenses are governed by the United States Sentencing Guidelines and the guidelines for economic crimes have come to be unnecessarily reliant on a few easy to calculate or quantify criteria such as what was the amount of the loss, how many victims were there, but there's come to be a recognition that a more nuanced and subtle uh, evaluation of culpability would be much more helpful in setting appropriate sentences for economic crimes. So the current guideline has been described by various judges in terms such as patently absurd on their face, a black stain on common sense, of no help. They routinely call for sentences of life without possibility of parole for first-time nonviolent offenders. They make no distinction between those who actually get the proceeds of a crime and those who do not. And the Sentencing Commission has recognized a need to reform that guideline. And the reason that we stepped in, the ABA Criminal Justice Section, is that o over the years we've come to learn that it is often helpful, rather than to simply criticize a law, to make a very concrete and specific proposal about how it could be done better. And so the ABA criminal justice section in April of last year formed what we've called the Task Force on the Reform of Federal Sentencing for Economic Crimes. We assembled what we hope to be, uh, or what we believe to be, an excellent group of people. We have selected federal judges. We went to academia. We wanted law professors who had written and thought carefully about the subject. We then reached out to the Department of Justice. We're very gratified that they sent their ex officio member of the commission, Jonathan Robluski, to serve on our task force as an observer. We also reached out to other organizations that were interested, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, the Federal Defenders, the, National, the uh, Families Against Mandatory Minimums, and we have liaisons or representatives from those organizations. And then we have uh, an array of very talented and experienced criminal defense lawyers. And over the course of about a year and a half, we have drafted what we believe to be a better guideline. And we have presented it to the commission. We have continued to work on refining it. We are now in the final stages of our work where we are prepared to release an additional report in which we set forth some case scenarios. And we apply our proposed guideline to those scenarios and explain how it would work. And we contrast it with the current guideline. Uh, the Commission is poised to take this issue up. We hope that they will study our guideline carefully. And we're gratified that even in the interim, some judges have been looking at our guideline and finding it helpful. And a number of courts have used uh, our work in fashioning a reasonable and appropriate sentence in these kinds of cases. And we hope that that will continue to be of assistance to the judiciary. Implicit bias is a bias that every one of us has that we're unaware of, that we hold in our subconscious and act on and project without being aware. It's important because this affects our criminal justice system. It affects how our judges act on the bench. It affects how jurors make decisions. And it affects how we represent our clients, uh, whether a prosecutor or a defense lawyer. It's been exposed through studies by various universities, most notably Harvard. Uh, and you can take studies online, tests online, to evaluate your own implicit bias. The results are remarkable and important. And I encourage you to take these tests because the first thing that we've learned about implicit bias is once you become consciously aware of your implicit biases, you also eliminate them. And that's why the American Bar Association Criminal Justice Section, in conjunction with our Section on Litigation and the Judicial Division, have undertaken a project to provide tr awareness, training, and tools to eliminate implicit bias in our courtroom. 
This year, Jim and I were invited to join with the Judicial Division to undertake a very exciting project. That is that uh, Judge Waxey, who's chair of the division, identified a problem that state judges do not have resources to address forensic problems. He noted that state judges across the nation may not even be aware of how to identify when they have a forensic science or forensic evidence issue for which they need to employ gatekeeping measures. Uh, he noted that federal judges have uh, a judicial training branch and resources and training materials. And so the Judicial Division along with the Criminal Justice Section are joining together to present a hearing at mid-year meeting to identify these issues. We're joining together to propose resolutions and reports uh, to implement across the nation uh, the creation of a resource uh, to help judges, state judges, identify forensic issues and to teach them how to perform their gatekeeping function, identify and resolve all of those forensic issues. This joint project will then culminate in a symposium in which all of the information gathered to advise about the creation of this wonderful resource will be uh, com compiled and published. So we're very excited to join the Judicial Division in this important work this year.